So, you bought a radio code. Nice. I'm happy for you. And I don't think it's a secret that I work with radio code. I make some videos for their social media account and some of my videos are sponsored by them. And so is this one. Radio code has no saying in the selection of topics in my videos, but I thought this video would prevent some emails. Don't get me wrong, I'm really happy when I get these one or two emails per month, but I often get quite the same question and I hope I will answer this in the form of this video. This video is going to be about interpreting the three most common spectra that cause confusion among people that ask me. And they all have something to do with uranium. The radio code is a scintillation counter. Unlike a typical Geiger counter, it can not only easily locate radioactive sources, but it can also identify gamma emitting nucleides. This is something that many counters cannot do. I would guess that anyone who spends between $250 and $550 on something like this has a basic understanding of nuclear chemistry. So we can't measure alpha emitters, for example, like polonium-210 unless we have huge amounts, which we don't have. When I take a mineral like this, I can use the device to answer a few questions. Is it radioactive? Yes. Is it dangerous? More than a non-radioactive stone, but okay, if it's asbestos, I will just leave that question unanswered. In terms of radiation, it's about 10 times higher than the background level, but the question of danger is a bit more complicated. And I will leave the radio code on it and record a spectrum with it. The lower the count rate, the longer it takes, but the cleaner the spectrum will become. Ultimately, we have a spectrum that looks something like this. And radio code thought to themselves, hmm, the number of nucleides is limited, so let's help people read this spectrum. This is the PC version, where I first have to load the exported XML files into the library. The mobile version looks a bit different depending on whether you're using an Apple or Android phone. We have peaks, and they are all characteristic for certain nuclides. And when you hover your finger over them, you will see a purple line and then it will tell you the cursor is at 611 kilo electron volts. Do you mean the 609 kilo electron volt peak, which is likely to be here? And this would then belong to Bismuth 214, which is normally part of the Radium 226 series. These would be the other lines that you would see if it really were radium-226. The height correlates to the occurrence probability, but since the radio code, like any other gamma spectrometer, loses counting efficiency with increasing energy, a peak does not necessarily have to be higher, even if the line occurs more often. And yes, that's pretty close. This peak is LED 2010 at 64 kilo electron volts. I'm probably off by about 3 kilo electron volts in calibration. These peaks are usually very thin. Here they look a bit like hills and this is because we use a scintillator. The scintillation crystal is a cesium iodide crystal doped with thallium. This can only achieve a certain accuracy due to the nature of the crystal. The goal of the radiation detector manufacturer is now to get the software to make the signals as close as possible to the intrinsic accuracy of the signals from the scintillation crystal. For cesium iodide it's approximately 6.1%. The radio code 102 has a full width half maximum of 9.5%. For the radio code 103, it's 8.4%. And for the 103G, it's 7.4%. But the 103G no longer has cesium iodide, but gag. The smaller the half width, the easier it is possible to distinguish between closely spaced peaks and in general to measure more accurately. This is also the biggest criticism of radio code as other companies achieve a smaller half width with the same cesium iodide crystal. Let's continue. We look at the decay chain and see together with the spectrum, ah yes, the radioactivity of the unknown mineral comes from uranium. The mineral contains the uranium radium and the uranium actinium decay chain. We are able to identify nuclides of the uranium radium series with this spectrometer. Unlike with a typical Geiger counter, we can also say that the source of the radioactivity is uranium. But with a spectrometer, you cannot tell which uranium containing mineral it is. Torbanite, uraninite, etc. They would all look completely identical in the gamma spectrum, as long as the source of radiation is still uranium. So in summary, the chemical form that determines the mineral does not affect the gamma spectrum. We can verify all peaks again with the IAEA isotope browser app. You really have to look at the entire spectrum and see where all the peaks best fit. A thorium spectrum would look completely different. 
But yes, some peaks are energetically located in such a way that the individual peak could be assigned to both lead 2010 and americium 241. But if it really was americium 241, A, there would be something very strange about this mineral and B, the other peaks could not be explained. So you have to gather more information than just the energy of just one peak. Does it make sense that there is cobalt 60 in a stone which I found in the forest? Of course not. Cobalt 60 does not occur naturally. So these hypothetical peaks do not belong to cobalt 60, but are presumably high energy bismuth 214 lines of the uranium radium decay chain. Another small digression. I just mentioned thorium 232. It is one of the three natural relevant decay chains. Thorium can only stabilize the oxidation state of plus 4 under environmental conditions. Uranium can exist both as the uranyl, i.e. the uranium 6 plus, and the uranium 4 plus. Depending on the mineral, it is possible that uranium 4 plus can sneak into the crystal lattice of the mineral that actually contains thorium and vice versa. So if your peaks in the mineral do not match the nuclides of the two uranium decay chains, Perhaps check the thorium line. However, we do not just measure natural substances, but also chemically treated substances, which means that uranium is extracted from nature, that can be purified, and all of the decay products are now gone. Chemistry is done with elements, so I can make vertical cuts in this decay chain, which is sorted on the x-axis according to the proton number, i.e. the elements. If I do chemistry with uranium, I can cut it here. And then there is the question of half-life. Because if the subsequent daughters are short-lived enough, they can be produced after separation via decay. This is the case with uranium. Thorium-234 is short-lived, but thorium-230 is not. This means that this part of the decay chain reforms and this one is separated away. Uranium is often used in uranium glass or uranium glazes. This means that we only have these nuclides in there. I simply use uranium nitrate because I'm not patient enough to actually do this with uranium glass. And what do we see? Six peaks. Let 2010 would fit in terms of energy, but again, we have separated that nuclide. Samarium-153, where should that come from? It is not contained in uranium glass. Uranium-235 is very likely. I always neglect the uranium-actinium series because it only accounts for 0.7%, but it's still there. And there it marks four out of six peaks for us. Uranium-235 has also a line at 168 kiloelectron volts. This uranium isotope is more rare than the uranium-238, but about 57% of all the case can account for this line. Unfortunately, I can't hit the low energy ones right now, but I'm shown at what energies they should be. 63 and 93 kiloelectron volts. Zooming out further, we have the productinium 234M lines. As you can see, they are reproduced from uranium 238. The 93 line is a uranium X-ray line. So in most cases, this larger peak is a combination of A, the detector efficiency, which peaks at this energy range, and B, the X-ray lines from uranium at 93 kiloelectron volts to 98 kiloelectron volts, and thorium at 89 to 93 kiloelectron volts. These effects all overlap, and then we have something like this in the spectrum. Now for the last marked peak, 63 kiloelectron volts. This is a line from thorium-234, again a daughter nucleus of the uranium radium decay series. How did I find that out? I looked at all the possible relevant nuclides in the decay series and then compared the spectrum with the entries for the nuclides in the isotope browser. That's about 40 kiloelectron volts and it cannot be barium x-ray lines as barium is not present. The assignment is a little bit difficult for me because I calibrated it very poorly in the low energy range. My best guess would be that I calibrated really poorly and that is a 25 kiloelectron volt line from thorium 231. If that's the case, the 84 kiloelectron volt line should also be visible, but it may well overlap with the uranium x-ray lines. If you've noticed this peak, please feel free to write about it in the comment section along with a brief explanation. Let's move on to the next card in the uranium radium series, namely radium. After the radium 226, the sample is usually completely in radioactive equilibrium up to the stable lead 206. All peaks are easily identified and here comes the 186 kiloelectron volt peak 
from radium and not from uranium-235 because we have chemically separated it away. High energy bismuth lines can also be seen. As for the explanation for this peak at approximately 149 kiloelectron volts, which is not technetium 99 m I have to guess and looking at the count rate of 13,500 CPS or 801,000 CPM, I think that it's not unlikely to be piled up from low energy gamma and x-ray lines. This is an effect where two quanta arrive simultaneously and form a sum peak. This is actually very undesirable and this explanation is only possible with very high count rates. This spectrum comes from the source here. At the request of viewers, I've measured it a bit more precisely and I made sure that the cross of the device was always at the same height as the center of the emitter. In the background, you can see the count rates and intervals displayed and after decay correction, the radium activity on the day of measurement, June 5th, 2025, is no longer 5.21 microcuries but rounded to 5.1 microcuries or 180.7 kilobecquerels. Most of the values are rough estimates where I just took the mean average for the measurements of 10 seconds. Here's a contact measurement. Of course the thickness of the plastic and the offset of the crystal are still a thing but you can just look that up. Since I can't get any more closer to this I will call this a contact measurement. Of course the radio code has many other functions which some of them I haven't even tested. <laughs> Have fun you guys! A special thanks goes to the working group of analytics and fundamental nuclear chemistry from Dr. Eric Strupp and the division of nuclear chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my patreons. With that being said, thank you for your attention and goodbye!